want to turn it over to our very, very distinguished panelists to introduce themselves and share out a little bit of what they're working on. Thanks, Antoon. Uh, Daniel Kraft. I'm originally a Stanford-trained physician in internal medicine, pediatrics, and hematology oncology, so not a mental health expert, but uh, have sort of lived for the last 15 or so years looking at the conversions of, te of technologies, including digital and beyond, to think about how do we reimagine and reboot parts of, of healthcare, uh, chaired medicine, something called Singular University, run a program called Exponential Medicine, now Next Med Health, that brings folks from 40 countries and uh, you know 50 different fields together to, to rethink healthcare in different ways. Um, on the digital health side, there's a lot of activities still the early stages, as was mentioned. Um, I see part of the challenge of uh, there's lots of solutions out there. Uh, many of them are not being utilized as, as, as they could be. Just sort of built and launched a little platform called digital.health, which sort of helps integrate and provide a bit of a, a finding feature, a bit of a digital formulary for clinicians and others uh, to, to find and use and prescribe. Sometimes they're digital therapeutics, sometimes others. So part of what I do is trying to look at what's the art of the possible today and what's coming next. And that platform is just one small example. So um, that's one of the hats I wear. Thank you. So hi, everybody. I'm Nicole Bradford, and it's my mission to bring transformation to anyone, anywhere. And so what that looks like is one, I invest with a fund that's focused on transformation and human potential, so specifically mental health, social health, emotional health, purpose, performance. I call it wellness and well-being tech. The second part that I think is really relevant for this conversation we've had today is that I have an extensive background in gaming, and that includes having operated World of Warcraft China, and I spent just under two years working on Fortnite. Um, and so I really understand engagement and, and thinking about how we do that with games for this space. And then the third thing is that I started uh, transformativetech.org. Mikey Siegel was one of our early co-founders with that. And that was back in 2015. And so what that means is that over the last, you know, going on, coming up on 10 years, I've seen a lot of successes and I've also seen a lot of composting on what worked and what didn't work. And, um, and so that's why I'm here. Those three things. Uh, hi. Uh, I think most of you have sort of at least been introduced to me. Uh, so I previously was a neurosurgeon here at Stanford uh, for many years and also founded the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And I've had an interest in this issue of compassion, connection, and caring, and how critically important it is in the context of uh, having mental health. And uh, one of the things that I've been involved with is one, uh, creating interventions uh, in this regard, uh, some based on mindfulness type of practices, but a little different. And I say that because uh, what often is left out is explicit uh, compassion for self, which then changes how you see the world in terms of others and allows you to be more compassionate. And so we've developed programs here at Stanford that are international in scope. And then the other side of it is trying to understand, and I said earlier and others, this issue of adverse childhood experiences and how that has such a profound impact on mental health. You know, we talked about actually briefly um, mindfulness programs in schools. Well, it does work. There's no question about it. The problem is, though, if a child is hungry or if there's violence or alcohol and drug abuse at their home, it's really hard to concentrate on being mindful. And these are fundamental systemic changes that have to be addressed to deal with these issues. So while it's great to have some of these great technologies, unless you address some of these structural problems, income inequality, you're not going to be effective, unfortunately. That being said, um, one of the things that I've been involved with the last few years is I founded a, a company called Happy, H-A-P-P-I dot A-I. And what that does is actually, it's not <clears throat> meant to be therapy because if you are able to address one's anxiety and one's stress, not in the context of therapy, but in the context of having the ability to talk to a friend, that is very powerful. And this has been shown in a variety of studies. So imagine a situation where we have a phone app that 
assesses your mental state while you're utilizing it and it tracks that. And then you created a AI generated conversational AI focused on compassion focused dialogue. And that's shared with you via a human avatar. And it can be extraordinarily powerful. The reason is, as has been mentioned, uh, most people are in fear of judgment. That's what causes so much anxiety. It's fear that people are going to judge us and we're not going to be worthy. So having a avatar that accepts you for who you are is available for you 24-7 versus having to wait to the therapist to see them for a week or so when you're already boiling over with stress and anxiety. But imagine you can talk to it any time, even at midnight, and it just begins a conversation with you. Now, I'm trying to create an MVP on this, and this is a very complicated task, but I hope that the advantage of this is one that not only is it efficacious, but the reality is there are not enough therapists for us to all have a therapist. And uh, by giving people a tool that they see as a friend that is infinitely scalable, can be modified in terms of culture and speaks innumerable languages, then I think this is potentially a solution that can be highly beneficial. Uh, to a lot of people. And of course, one of the other reasons I'm here is to learn from all of you and my colleagues and um, see what the possibilities are in the mental health space. So thank you. Thank you and hello. My name is Danny Gladden. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker uh, and I'm the general manager of behavioral health and social care for what is now Oracle Cerner. Uh, just uh, by way of kind of explanation, Cerner, uh, a a kind of big name in health IT and Oracle, obviously a big technology company, combined forces. And actually, as of October 1st, uh, legal entity combination occurred. And so we are now Oracle Health. Um, I'll be speaking, uh, being five days into the Oracle brand, I'll be speaking mostly uh, to uh, to Cerner, but I also want to speak to, you know, the excitement of, of Oracle taking a look at <clears throat> healthcare as a vertical in saying we want to materially move the needle in this space. And I was, I was so happy that, you know, in, in, the, in one of the first sort of public statements Larry Ellison uh, made a, around sort of why healthcare was a specific anecdote around mental health and connecting uh, the person who's in crisis uh, at 2 a.m. The, and the, the, um, maybe the safety officer or crisis worker that encounters them and connecting the, the, the real-time data that's collected to that ER physician that's going to see this patient and, um, and having the throughput to an inpatient bed or outpatient services and so on. And so super excited about the scalability that I believe the Oracle Cerner combination is going to provide materially in the in the in the in the mental health space um, so from from a certain perspective we are um, an electronic health record right electronic health record is uh, is a tool for the operation of um, of, 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 a, of a practice right from registration and scheduling to clinical workflows uh, to um, sort of uh, reporting, analytics, um, regulatory privacy, data protection, um, and consumer uh, consumer pieces as well through, say, patient portals and things of that nature. Uh, within sort of that ecosystem, um, Cerner has a has a behavioral health product um, a, across uh, you know globally. We we have about 400 hospitals, health systems, community mental health centers that. Um, that utilize our product. Now, the reason I sort of sort of spend just a moment to sort of speak to this is uh, you heard my question earlier to the Congresswoman sort of around digitizing of the behavioral health record. There's a consensus, I'm sure, in this room that data is important. It's important for research. 
Um, but it's also important for continuity of care. And right now, there, there aren't financial incentives for providers to digitize the record. And, a, and a, you know, uh, over half of providers in the U.S. are still documenting mental health services, substance use treatment services um, on paper. And so in order for us to have complete connectivity, right, so that the, the wearable technology that's being described and, and the other sort of uh, uh, digital therapeutics that's being described, uh, connected to an electronic health record, um, connected to health information exchange technologies, so that with your permission, regardless of, of where you go, um, you, your diagnostic history is present, uh, you, your, your treatment history is present, your uh, medication history is present, and um, you don't have to sort of start from scratch, which so many, so many of the, the patients and consumers that I've encountered over the years, one of their biggest frustrations is that they're constantly uh, being forced to retell their story. Uh, they don't feel heard. They don't feel honored. They don't feel respected. And so I, it's, it's super important. Um, and I'm kind of beginning with the end in mind as far as my call to action is um, to digitize the record. Now, within an electronic record ecosystem, a lot of great tools to help with workflows, clinical decision support, using uh, data-informed treatment, um, and, and so on. But I, I won't sort of kind of bore you with that. I will tell you, you know, I, I accidentally started using technology and behavioral health at the very start of my career. I sat in a room in St. Louis and did a biopsychosocial assessment with a, a member of the Clinkett and Haida community in Southeast Alaska uh, via telehealth and very, uh, very sort of rudimentary <laughs> technology. And um, shortly thereafter, I, I worked in Alaska for a number of years um, in some of the most remote, remote part of the state, standing up um, standing up telehealth services. No doubt telehealth can democratize access, um, but we have to ensure that, that folks have the access. And, and a lot of times, some of the folks who are the heaviest utilizers of services, there's a real technology equity gap, right? Whether it's hardware, whether it's bandwidth, or whether it's knowledge, um, we can we can create the best digital therapeutics and wearables, right? But if they can't get to the folks who are the most vulnerable in our communities, um, right? Then we we got some work to do. So I love the scalability question. I love the like I'm I'm every speaker today. I'm sort of thinking through that lens. How do we scale? How do we scale? Um, and I think tech equity is an important part of that. Thanks, Danny. Uh, so we wanted to start with kind of the good news in mental health treatment. And if I could ask each of you, you know, tell me what you're working on that you're most excited about. And if you could please tie it to patient outcomes, you know, talk about what we're really doing for patients, what these technologies are actually able to achieve in the clinical setting you know, today or what you see is going to be achievable in the next couple of years. Let's, let's get everybody to understand just how much progress has already been made. Yeah. Well, I'll start with the sort of reminder that we live in this, you know, accelerating exponential age. What's possible on our mobile phones or our smartwatches is quite magical compared to a decade ago. And the next 10 years will look, make the, the next look slow. There's there's a tendency to underappreciate exponentials, but also sometimes over uh, uh, think what's going to happen next. There's a Mars law. We tend to under, underestimate the next couple of years, and underestimate the next decade. So I think it's exciting to look at the next decade. What I'm most interested about or thinking about the art of the possible is to put together, you know, we've mentioned you know, from wearables and microbiome and genome and our digitome to start to mash those up. This idea of the digital twin, I don't think it's been measured, mentioned yet, so that we can start to uh, put that together in a meaningful way so that we can optimize care on the continuum from putting my pediatrician hat, you know, early intervention or prevention or inoculating kids against mental health challenges all the way to that's possible on um, common or severe mental illness. So um, I'm involved in advising a few companies that are doing interesting work like an uh, investor in a company called Marrow Health, which is scaling uh, digital interventions with real psychologists for psych for anxiety and depression. Or uh, um, the issue on, on scaling is often 
bringing not just data, but insights. You know, we've got lots of data, but no clinician wants the raw data. They want the insights that they can leverage in their workflow or the patient or the caregiver or the human. So I, I think an exciting example of the, the edge of that today is um, a company called Stuff That Works that Health out of Israel that's sort of building a, a Waze or Google Maps for Health where you can share what's working or not working from everything from psoriasis to depression to anxiety to uh, rare cancers and, and makes crowdsource that information to the point where it's useful to you or patients like me or patients like mine uh, and then integrate that into clinical care. So those are a few examples and I think the proviso for all of us thinking with the end in mind for a decade is to think where things might be with AI robotics to 3D printing, to nanotech, to voice as a biomarker, uh, to the $100 genome, and, and how do we put those together in ways and not be stuck with our, our concept of what's possible in 2022. Yeah. Daniel and I spent a lot of time talking to one another, and uh, we also invest in some of the same companies. So what I'm really the most excited about, um, and, and I'll focus on an area where I think I can add a different perspective is that today, like everyone born today is a gamer and half of the world plays games. Um, and so that's really where the population is, especially when we use words like scale. I think what's really exciting too is I feel after such a long time of, of having been in that space, I feel like the medical community is really um, thinking about it now. And this last two years where we all have gotten trained digitally um, has made people really willing to consider alternative platforms for these sorts of things. I think one of the biggest things that has me excited is um, an understanding that if no one uses it, you know, if the if 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 the experience is so bad and no one uses it, then it's the same as if it didn't exist. And so, you know, I think with diagnosis that are fairly uh, severe, then certainly you have to have like these very solid things. But when we're talking about prevention and getting in there early, I think that games and uh, digital environments present an extraordinary opportunity. In addition, those digital environments also allow the pickup of a variety of bio data uh, and bio signals. And so presuming that we do get the privacy uh, solved, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. So one of the companies that um, I love is a company called Deepwell. And um, the reason why I'm raising it is that what you see in that company's DNA is a meeting of uh, game people who truly have world-class gaming experience and uh, people who have cleared FDA devices, uh, medical devices, and, you know, are really coming at it from a established clinical point of view. But there's a great deal of respect between the two. And what I'm seeing in that DNA is not uh, the point of view that um, the medical side knows best. Um, it's medical side saying, how do we really get engagement? Um, and how do we make this work? The last thing I would say about what has me excited and what I think is going to happen in the next 10 years um, is that, you know, a lot of times when people think about games, um, they, they're looking from the outside in. So one, 77% of all the people who play games in the United States play with other people. It is not a solo activity at all. And so what that means also is what most people don't understand about games, um, is that they think that gamification is, um, leaderboards and you know and high scores and medals but a real game is play and community and narrative um and so you know it's been my observation with transformation that people don't change until their story about themselves change they might change their behavior but they don't really own it until the story changes and so i think that one of the things that we're going to see in the next decade is we're really going to see these digital platforms become tools that really allow, you know, real transformation, real prevention of all age groups around the world, cost effective. And so we just have to really get busy about thinking about how to do that uh, well. And, and it really means these communities coming together. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, just a couple points, and actually to reiterate a few things. Uh, this idea of uh, 
community is extraordinarily powerful. And when you can be with a community, which I would suggest has positive intentions, not one that supports hate and divisiveness, but where it's a recognition of your interdependence and the reality that you have to work together to achieve a goal, this, I think, is one of the best things for your own mental health because you get out of your own head. And even in the gaming world, uh, you can be of service by helping others. And there's immense reward with that, and it has a huge profound effect on a per, a perception of who you are. So I think that area is particularly interesting. In fact, uh, I was having a conversation. How many of you remember that game? Uh, and I can't think of the name of it. It's the one where you feed the little digital animal. Remember that one? Tamaguchi. Tamaguchi. Yeah. Right, right. But, you know, and how many spent so much time invested in feeding that animal for nothing? <laughs> Other than, I mean, real. I mean, but in your mind, you were doing something to benefit someone else. And I think you could even create a game that actually helps you by actually doing actions like this to be of service. But it couldn't even involve other individuals getting back to this uh, sort of gaming world. It's interesting. I have a 13 year old. And I have to say, I was probably the critical ones because he loves to play these multiplayer games. And <clears throat> fortunately, my wife is much wiser than I because I said, he's spending so much time on the computer. What a waste of time. But she said, no, he communicates with people. He has friends from all over the world. He is learning something. They're working together to achieve a goal. That is what it's really all about. And that's the way it should be in life. We're trying to achieve a goal to accomplish something that ultimately uh, benefits everyone. So that's one comment on that side. And I think the um, <clears throat> sort of theme that goes through all of this is over and over again. It's uh, connection, it's compassion, and frankly, at the end of the day, it's love. And that's where we have to be centered. Now, Mike had mentioned something about uh, the microbiome. And actually, uh, one of the things that I've been interested in is this reality, because there's a fair amount of literature, actually, on how um, the microbiome affects mood and is associated in some instances with depression. And certainly we know that, especially with the modern Western diet, this disrupts our normal microbiome. So we're doing a meta-analysis of all the papers written about mood change and how it affects the microbiome. Now, I don't know what the final answer is, but I'm excited about uh, learning about that more because there's clearly evidence that there's certain uh, uh, bacteria that could be extraordinarily beneficial for you. Uh, the other thing is there's a company that uh, is called Pure, P-U-U-R.com. And I've been an advisor to them for a while. But the interesting thing about that is that this is a platform that allows you to connect with another person on demand and it asks a series of questions and you allow the person on the other end to answer the questions. You don't interrupt them. You thank them for their answer. And then it goes back in the other direction. And one of those questions is how does shame express itself in your body as an example? And so some of these issues, which are actually going deep, and you can actually, again, getting back to this issue of being judged, you can actually do it anonymously with some people. But what's amazing about it is, and I've seen this over and over again, these types of sort of micro communications that occur frequently have a profound, profound impact. And they're like these little nudges or habits when you start doing those types of things. And you have a person you feel comfortable with. And again, this whole issue over and over again of uh, non-judgment. The other thing I would just like to comment on, which maybe is not so much digital, but maybe it is becoming digital, is, as you all know, there's a plethora of uh, psychedelic companies nowadays, and there's one which I'm an advisor called Spinoza.co, and this is focused primarily on psilocybin. But what we're seeing here is all these tools to gain access to how we change our mind. And we talked about adverse childhood experiences, which the reality is that what happens is 
you start carrying baggage with you throughout your life. And that baggage affects every aspect of your life. It affects your food choices. It affects your partner uh, and a whole variety of, of other things. But it happens at an unconscious level. But it's still baggage you carry with you. And most people are frankly not aware of that reality. And you have, can have conversations with individuals, but the driver oftentimes is not what's at the surface. It's what's underneath the surface. And some of these techniques, such as mindfulness types of practices, such as psychedelics, what they do is they give you the ability to do an ego reset, if you will. And I think this is very something very powerful to think about. What it allows you to do is to unload some of this baggage, which then allows you to see the world through a different lens. And when you're able to do that, you recognize that every one else is suffering. And when you recognize that, then of course, that allows you much better ability to be your authentic self and connect with others. Because that's why you look at the data from the blue zones, right? These places where people are, are living to over 100. Well, I know you've probably seen the million cookbook on the Mediterranean diet, which obviously I don't practice. But um, <laughs> but what I would tell you is by far and away what is more important than anything. It's not exercise. It's not um, being at your ideal body weight. By far and away, the most important thing, again, is always the same. Social connection, deep relationships, period. That's it. That is the cure for almost all the problems we're talking about. So the key here that we need to focus on is how do we get there to offer that to people in a seamless way, utilizing whatever technologies are available or whatever tools there are. And just from the conversations we've had, there are many ways to get there. We just have to figure out what works best for that individual person. And I think when we do that, then we'll see a true renaissance of a lot of these uh, therapies. Thanks. Thanks. And, and in the interest of time, I want to get us to the, the next portion of the discussion. Dana, I know you have a quick comment. You want to jump in? And I was going to say one technology that feeds into gaming and social connection, which hasn't been mentioned yet, is sort of where virtual reality is going, the metaverse for good and bad. Um, there's ways to, I think Jeremy Balenson at Stanford showed that if you were Superman flying around helping people virtually, then you're much more socially connected and able to be altruistic in your real world. Um, I spent 100 days early in the pandemic exercising in a game called Supernatural, which was helpful and has a sense of community and gamification. So I just think it's worth watching that space to enable some of these tools. There's even uh, uh, Trip, T-R-I-P-P, a sort of yeah. a game that sort of tries to be psychedelic. Okay. Elements, so. Thanks. So that's the good news. We have all these new digital tools and then some tools that are pharmacological and some that are the combination. Um, now let's talk about the bad news. Uh, so I think the first time I ever saw any presentation about personalization, using data to personalize the treatment of depression, for example, during pharmaceuticals, I think probably was in 2015, 2016. Uh, and there was a group at UCSF that had developed what was, what they believed to be a digital biomarker. And they were using accelerometers and your and your smartwatch and heart rate and heart rate variability, and they were able to make some prognostic prognostic predictions about the course of your depression scores, and importantly, able to identify digital phenotypes that would predict your response to different SSRIs. Okay, so that's been around for a while. Now there are two companies, Feel and Health Rhythms. Uh, that have managed to bring the predictive potential of these uh, types of algorithms up to the point that they're clinically recognizable as something that can drive treatment. And they have FDA approvals under the medical device side of the regulatory scheme to enable physicians to more precisely choose the right medication for the right patient for treatment of depression and anxiety almost 10 years to get from that very first paper to the FDA approval. And as I'm sure many of you in this room know, if you go to a physician today and say, hey, doc, you know, I, I can't get out of bed. I'm not enjoying any daily activities. My sleep's all disrupted. 
You know, they may give you a questionnaire on paper. They may tell you to go to a website to take the questionnaire, but very few physicians would say, okay, great, let's get you this digital diagnostic. Let's figure out which depression medication is the right one for you so that you can get rapid relief. So I think that's part of the bad. That's one facet of um, what I view as the global challenge around these digital technologies, which is how do we get regulatory authorities to recognize the value? How do we educate physicians on what's possible and get these things integrated into standard of care and not just at you know, elite tertiary academic institutions like Stanford, how do we get that down to every community, every physician, no matter when they graduated from medical school or when's the last time they went to their industry conference? And then how do we get those treatments paid for so that patients can engage with the best possible quality of care without fear that they're going to hit get hit with some bill that they simply can't pay? So I think we have multiple facets of access challenges and scalability challenges. Um, and I'd love to have our panelists, if you speak to how we can fix those and what, and if you can, what you are doing with your companies or your organizations to whittle away at those access challenges. I might, I might start with that here. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, so, so uh, I think a couple of points and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll kind of do the good and the bad and I'll go quick. I, I do want to mention one of the very positive things right now um, and sort of this broader discipline is uh, 988, um, the national sort of three digit number for the suicide, uh, suicide lifeline mm -hmm. um, and also the use of technology to access crisis uh, chat and text in real time. Um, also uh, a positive in, in sort of the EHR workflow uh, is, is universal screening of uh, uh, the Columbia protocol, for example, or, or depression screening, right? 100% of patients being asked. The, the con is we have a taxed system, right? Where are these patients going to go? Uh, the con, we, we have providers who... who um, who are doing their best and, and sort of asking about suicide, but but don't have sort of the training um, to sort of, okay, work with someone to build a collaborative safety plan. Um, instead, the folks are being over hospitalized or in, in, incarcerated or restrained or, or, you know, really traumatic interventions um, as a result. And so uh, definitely some work to do to use technology to embed, uh, to embed workflows, clinical decision support, and care pathways, um, so that so that the nurse at 2 a.m. doesn't have to be uh, sort of a, a mental health expert, but can provide compassionate, uh, trauma-informed, culturally humble um, interventions. Um, so I think um, I think that you know, and I just will say one more thing about um, you know, kind of. The, the the bad side of where we are with technology, it just concerns. I mean, I just, on the one hand, I get so excited about all this great work. And then I think about the folks um, in, in Nome, Alaska, right? And how does the science reach them? How does the technology reach them, right? And, you know, how do we get outside of sort of the academic health systems so that the research and the technology you know, can reach folks who aren't very profitable um, in the in the sort of the healthcare delivery model. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, just to make a couple quick comments, the life of a family practitioner is very challenging, as is a pediatrician. It is overwhelming, and you know, we talk about. Uh, uh, looking for this, looking for that, getting insights, doing this or that. Well, you know, if you have 15 or 20 minutes to see a patient, in no way do you have adequate time to understand these issues. And again, this is another fundamental structural problem, which contributes uh, to a whole variety of the issues we're talking about, which is so how do we fix it? Uh, I'll get there. <laughs> 
Well, I think uh, how many uh, are, are people are physicians here? And how many of you love the electronic medical record? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, to be bluntly honest with you, that is one of the most useless consumers of time of a physician. And nothing separates you more from your patient than typing on a computer and being limited to 15 or 20 minutes to interact with the patient. It is a complete waste of time, which separates you from the patient. What you need to do, and there's a, a Francis Peabody said in 1927, the care of the patient is caring for the patient. And I'll tell you a really quick anecdote about this. I would have patients come to me because of this compassion work that I do. They have no neurosurgical problem whatsoever. And literally, they would come and, and they would tell me that. They go, but I just wanted to talk to you. And so the whole time I'm with them, I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's not your fault. You know, you shouldn't carry this with you. It's not because of you. And at some point, usually about five or 10 minutes, they have a cathartic breakthrough. They burst into tears. And then I have to hold them or hug them for about five or 10 minutes. Now, that's not my job as a neurosurgeon. <laughs> but my point to you, this is what people crave. They want to be simply listened to. And I think that is the solution, is listening to people and having the time to do that. I, I think you have someone here left that wants to be listened to. I know you have a great answer. Yeah. So um, on, so you all know on the pro side, I deeply believe in technology. I think it will address a lot of the cost, especially in some of the ways that we've described it so far. What I'm concerned about is hypervigilance and how the all of the feedback is getting like you're starting to see the beginnings of hypervigilance where people are getting anxious with all of their devices. And I'm concerned about privacy um, because we are so revealed by these things, the signals that can be picked up, that it's very important, I think, for people to know that their data is safe, that it won't be used against them. But then we also need the large data set. This was what the previous panel talked about. Um, so I think between those two, I think it's sort of, you know, the technology is also the answer, and uh, we have to mitigate some of the downstream effects of it. Fantastic. So super, super briefly, um, the dark side is there's sometimes too many solutions out there to make sense of. I gave a TED Talk in the Future of Medicine. There's an app for that. In 2011, there was 20,000 apps. Now there's 300,000-ish health-related apps. Many are not FDA-cleared uh, uh, digital therapeutics, but some are. Um, and the clinician uh, is overwhelmed and has horrible UI so part of it is improving the workflow and integrating, whether it's your sleep score, your mental health uh, biomarkers into your uh, virtual visit. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do to address that with digital.health is to create that formulary and start to match the solutions that match your patient's needs. A patient with anxiety, maybe I prescribe Headspace, maybe that gets paid for. Right. Maybe it's an aura ring to track and optimize sleep, but that data can flow back in a feedback loop that's not just the data and overwhelms me, but highlights those patients who need uh, a high touch virtual or in person. So um, there's a need to sort of synthesize that enough to see up-level up ones that work and match. Yeah. And I, I think that's a great catalog that physicians can look at. And now we need to make sure all physicians know to go look at the catalog. Or, or, or add your solution there. It's easy to add the ones you have. It's still growing. Yeah, please do. Okay, so now we're going to progress to the speed round. Uh, want everybody, 10 seconds, 15 max, give your call to action to this audience. What would you ask everybody who has the power to do so in this room to do in order to get more of these solutions out to the patients that need them or to develop better solutions? Ten seconds. I think the magic comes at the convergence of different fields, uh, whether it's gamers or AI or VR, 3D print. All, you know, the magic is not just having mental health professionals in the room, but folks from different technology sets. And that's where uh, you can have an unmet need and solve for it in, in new ways, especially leveraging uh, exponential and fast moving technologies. And uh, be aware of your biases around what design looks like. The entire design space is the physical layer, the transformative digital layer where the data goes up and down, and then the fully digital layer. The whole thing is something we can use. And so be open-minded to that. I think the uh, call to action is um, continuing to force the integration of knowledge we have from a variety of different platforms 
into a single narrative that offers help, whatever uh, uh, that, that type of help is, uh, to allow for human thriving. And I think that's a big challenge for all of us. Encourage uh, Congress to provide incentives to behavioral health providers to digitize the mental health record in a manner that does not cause overly administrative burden uh, for <laughs> providers. Um, and um, add me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash Danny Gladden. I'd love to collaborate with you. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, you can call me too. <laughs>